Hey, you guys, uh, this is our last lecture for the Great Depression. This is lecture four of four. So you've reached the last one. This should be about 20 minutes. And we're just kind of encapsulating the Great Depression. Uh, do we get out of it? Sort of what is the legacy? And where do we go from here? Is obviously World War II. Uh, so that'll be our next unit that comes in second semester. Uh, so let's get to it. Let's uh, wrap up the Great Depression so we can stop being thoroughly and greatly depressed, right? So, uh, but thanks for doing so well at bearing with it. So here's where we were at last time. We were kind of talking about this. So what FDR brought was an increased spending. He blew up the budget for what many people say were good reasons to give Americans job to get jobs and work. Uh, there, there was building dams or bridges or new buildings or new parks. Uh, all this got expanded in the 1930s as this opportunity to give Americans jobs. Now, it was the federal government that gave them jobs, and it increased our national deficit. And so a lot of economists look, historians look, and they're like, did that actually, you know, uh, stimulate our economy to grow? Or did it stagnate our economy so it took longer because it wasn't private business or small businesses sort of generating jobs and revenue and the economy, but it was backed basically by the large spending of the government. But we have a lot of cool, uh, great things that were done, especially our infrastructure, our dams being built, especially in this state, Grand Coulee Dam being built, Bonneville Dam, uh, Dow's Dam being built, like most of our dams, hydroelectric dams that we get our cheap electricity from, built in the 1930s during the Great Depression. So we owe a lot still to these dams that are now almost 90 years old uh, in our aging and many of our bridges that are aging and have to be rebuilt and, and things that need work because they're so old and we really haven't revisited them since the 1930s. Uh, so, but as we go forward, let's kind of talk about the legacy and, and uh, where we go. As far as Roosevelt, a great another legacy moment is the Social Security Administration, which is still around uh, uh, in helping elderly once you retire uh, in your 60s at some point, determines how much money you're given on a monthly basis from the government to help sort of retire on. Maybe you have other retirement savings you've been working on when you've been working in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s that is supposed to offset the cost as well uh, and improve how much you can retire on. But Social Security is definitely a pivotal uh, piece for many Americans that still depend on it. Uh, so another lasting legacy of the New Deal programs. And so as we get to the election, uh, there's another election. So we talked about 1930, he, Roosevelt won in 1932. He's going to win again in 1936. Uh, but we're in the throes of the Great Depression. So it's not all good, even within Roosevelt's first term. Uh, you know, 20% of uh, cities workers are unemployed still. So it's still one fifth, tremendously high number. That's double the amount that we had during the Great Recession. Uh, the highest our unemployment got when Obama was president was 10% unemployment. So still think of 20%, that's double where we were at in 2008, nine and 10. Uh, and so also by 1934, 1 1.5 million workers go on strike. They might have jobs, but they feel like they're not being paid enough. So they literally walk off their job until they're paid higher. Uh, and so there's over 18,000 total strikes just in that year alone. So it's the rights of labor saying, hey, we're not being treated well. We're not getting paid well. We're not going to work until we're paid our demands. Many times, a lot of these strikers were just let go. They were fired. Uh, workers called strike breakers were brought in where, hey, there are people that need jobs or need work, and they're brought in because uh, they want employment too. So a very contentious time in American history. We actually, you know, had many conversations about should we be a communist country? Should we move to socialism where the government pays everything out kind of and directs all businesses or communistic where government is going to give everything equally to everyone? Some very serious conversations about whether we should change from capitalism because capitalism is failing us and do something a bit more liberal. Uh, which we never got there. It wasn't really close to getting there, but there was a small minority, uh, just as there is nowadays that say, like a Bernie Sanders nowadays that says, hey, we need government to give us more, to hand out more, or like Andrew Yang, give us a monthly 1,000 check. Uh, so those conversations really start in the 1930s, and uh, it's still a small minority now as it was then, but have been around 
and that do sound appealing to some Americans. But uh, what's going to happen basically throughout the Depression is we're going to have slow, sluggish economic growth until the 1940s, basically until World War II, and we're fighting a war of our survival, and government is just writing blank checks to businesses, to people, to military men uh, and women. Like, until we get to that point, we are really going to have a slow, sluggish economy throughout all the 1930s. And again, historians and economists can differ. Was it Franklin Roosevelt's like increased spending that took us so long to come out of our depression? Or could he have really spent even more and, uh, and it would have accelerated growth? So we really have the same blueprint now that we did in the 1930s, which when we have a recession, uh, let's spend more money, uh, give more money to citizens so that they're spending money and generating business. And, and uh, that's been kind of our blueprint. And so our national debt has continued to grow and grow and grow. And now it's at our highest it's ever been. There's really no talk about paying it down, especially during the coronavirus. Uh, let's just keep going into debt. Um, you know, it, is that check going to have to be paid on that debt at some point? Like we have to use uh, some of the money to pay off our debt of from years past. So, uh, you know, from my financial outlook, I'm not an economist. You know, some people would say it doesn't look good. Some people say it doesn't look good this year. Uh, even as far as a recession might be coming again. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see, hope for the best and, and uh, do our best to save and not spend frivolously. So I think that's one of the lessons that you could see of people that lived through the 1930s is, you know, saving, uh, really cherishing what you have and uh, making the most uh, of what you have in the time you have. So uh, however, Roosevelt is going to be reelected in elections in 1940 and 1944. It's, they won't be as big of a margin landslide victories as in 1932 and 36, but he's going to be elected a total of four times. The only president ever in American history elected four times. Now, George Washington got elected twice. So that was the tradition that every president kind of set and everyone knew when you got elected once. Oh, you got elected twice and I'm going to re retire after the second uh, term uh, and not going to run again. But Roosevelt was like, hey, we're in a national crisis, the Great Depression, 1940s. We could see uh, that the world was already at war. World War II had already started by 1940. So he kind of just said, hey, we need a national leader. I'm popular enough, which he was. He ran in 1940, easily won. And then in 1944, we're in the throes of World War II. We're not even looking like we're coming out of it yet, uh, which we will in 1944. That's going to be our successful triumph year where we turned the tide against the Nazis and the Japanese. Uh, but then Roosevelt's going to run and win then as well. So he's our only president in American history to win four terms. He doesn't serve out four full terms because he's going to die one year into his uh, fourth term. And he's going to die in 1945. So he only really got to serve one month of his fourth term. So he only served 12 12 years in a month, I guess, as president. So our longest president ever in American history. A lot of people like to debate that and say, that's awful. And that debate was true. And we got past part of the 25th Amendment says that uh, presidents can only serve two terms. They can only be elected twice. Now you could be vice president and take over and then get elected twice. That could happen. So you could serve potentially almost 12 years, uh, but you can only be elected twice by constitutional amendment. So here's the election of 1940. Uh, again, you see a pretty big landslide victory in terms of electoral votes. So Roosevelt's going to win 449 to 82. Popular vote is separated by about 5 million votes. Uh, so really not that close. Still a pretty big margin of victory. So this shows you Roosevelt's popularity in 1940 when he's running for a third time. And this set the, you know, a new precedent. Uh, never been done before. And here's how you kind of see it's broken up by counties. You see the South is very heavily uh, voting for the Democratic candidate for Roosevelt. Uh, this is kind of in the throes of segregation. Uh, and obviously, though we're in to the throes of World War, World War at this time too. Uh, so we'll start to see in the 50s as the civil rights movement starts in the 1960s that the South kind of just shatters and kind of breaks up so the electoral college map, but you see, even in Washington, we have pockets of conservatism, uh, but still voting uh, in wide margins for Franklin Roosevelt. Okay, and then here's the 1944. 
electoral college. So pretty much the maps look the same. If I go back, right, all that changes like Wyoming and some Ohio, Indiana changes. So you see the electoral vote is now 99 to Roosevelt's 432. Uh, and you see the popular vote shrinks for Roosevelt, but he still has 3.5 million more votes. So again, not that close, but got a bit closer. Uh, and then again, you start to see a bit more red in the national map. Again, you see the South very heavily Democratic because this was the party of Jim Crow. This was the party of segregation in the South. So they're going to support the Democratic candidates and very strongly. Like, <laughs> look at Mississippi, all blue, you know. And at this point, Blacks, African Americans are disenfranchised. They can't vote anywhere in the South because of these Jim Crow laws, too. So who are all the whites voting for? Uh, the Democratic Party. Okay. So, but some of the major controversies when uh, during the Great Depression, when Roosevelt was president, his conservatives, Republicans are going to continually attack FDR for interfering too much with private business, really polling uh, money from private businesses or opportunities from private businesses and setting up these government jobs, what we call public jobs, public sector jobs. And so he's going to be continually attacked by, attacked by conservatives for that. He's also going to have his Supreme Court overturn some of his New Deal programs and say, hey, forcing farmers not to farm uh, and not to make crops is unconstitutional. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Constitution that, you know, you can allow independent citizens not to do something. And now they were getting money, but getting money to not farm, uh, you know, it's not really constitutional. And that program, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, gets overturned by the Supreme Court. And so what does he do to really counter the Supreme Court, which was conservative when Roosevelt was president? Well, he uh, alleges that he's going to start packing the court. He's going to use the Democratic majority in the House and the Senate, which he has for a couple years in his presidency, to try to pack the court. What does that mean? Well, instead of nine Supreme Court justices, like there's been since the Civil War, he tries to expand it to 15. And again, just like any president has the power, they appoint Supreme Court justices, which then get confirmed by the Senate. But if you have nine people that aren't siding with you and you expand it to 15, hey, that's six more justices that you can add. And you're probably going to be liberal to believe what you believe. And so then those, that's going to have a tremendous sway on the Supreme Court and how they decide those things. This was a really unpopular idea, though when it happened and when Roosevelt proposed this and the Congress was talking about it, that's when he saw a lot of conservatives and Republicans receive a lot more support because you are fundamentally going to change what the Supreme Court is doing just so they start passing what you want them to pass. Uh, and ironically, Joe Biden is talking about doing that now when he becomes president, he's going to have a Democratic majority in the Senate. And so, but the Supreme Court is conservative with Trump's three appointments has swayed now to the conservative side. So Biden says, hey, I want them to approve everything that I'm getting Congress to pass and I'm going to approve it, but then the Supreme Court might overturn it. So, hey, I might consider packing the court and adding numbers of Supreme Court justices so that they get swayed to the liberal side so that they're gonna approve and pass everything that I want done in this country. And so that's still an allegation of the Democratic Party is that that could happen. So it might be another conversation we're hearing about uh, as Biden takes over the presidency on the 20th. Uh, here's this cartoon uh, at the time, and here's like a new judge, uh, court reform coming out to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court judges what's constitutional, right? And the, this guy's going against New Deal legislation. Well, this, the Supreme Court is acting as the referee on what is constitutional or not. But now, oh, here comes a new, new Deal court reform, adding Supreme Court justices that would utterly change sort of how the Constitution and new laws are being judged. So kind of interesting con conversation and controversy. And again, it's still coming up even 90 years later. So how did the Great Depression affect women? I'm going to talk about also African Americans and Native Americans. And so we're going to see that uh, for sort of women's rights outside the home is, is going to be uh, kind of set back. 
uh, during the Great Depression. So women are not going to be hired. They technically haven't been hired a lot. We see increased numbers of women participating in the workplace in the 1920s. But as the Great Depression comes and there's all this scarcity of jobs, women are, are not going to be hired in favor of men. Uh, uh, definitely married men who are supposed to be the breadwinner, but especially if married women are going to have to quit or it's expected that they quit to give that man that job to go be the breadwinner uh, out in the workplace. Okay, you, Women could only really prove that they had jo needed jobs with employers uh, if it was essential to their family survival, which happened. It's not that women weren't working during the Great Depression. Uh, it's that they were working in fewer numbers than they were in the 1920s. Uh, Roosevelt's all gonna, also going to name the first female cabinet uh, secretary. That's Frances, Frances Perkins. You don't have to remember her name, but the first sort of governmental post is given to a woman during Roosevelt's term, her presidency. And he's also going to uh, appoint the first female uh, to the federal court to be a federal court judge, uh, first female ambassador, and then the director of the Mint is also going to be a woman. So, so we're seeing some first women positions uh, in Roosevelt's administration. But it also still he is uh, critiqued and criticized that he put them in non-controversial positions. Uh, and so therefore they still had limited influence. Uh, so, but some new sort of opportunities for women uh, in terms of government during Roosevelt's administration. Also African-Americans gonna be a tremendous sort of switch. In 1934, most African-Americans are gonna switch their allegiance from voting for the Republican party. If you think of the Republican party, it was the party of Abraham Lincoln which wanted to get rid of slavery, which did when Lincoln was president. Then in Reconstruction, they wanted to continue to educate, free blacks, uh, give blacks uh, education, set up colleges, set up uh, funds to help uh, blacks financially. Uh, and so was the party that helped African-Americans leave slavery and enter into uh, freedom, really. That was the Republican Party. And so if you can imagine that that's the party that did that, they had the African-Americans voted for the Republican Party all the way up until 1934. And then you start to see the majority of Republicans after this time start to switch. Because as uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's giving jobs, he's kind of being kind of co colorblind. He's giving jobs to uh, people of all races. Uh, it's not necessarily happening all the time, uh, but uh, it wins sort of the allegiance of African Americans to start voting for the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's not like a wide margin, it's like 60 40 that are now voting for uh, Roosevelt in the 1930s. But we're going to see, especially as we get to Johnson in 1964, there's going to be a huge sort of uh, in sway of African Americans now voting for the Democratic Party. And it continues to be so up until today up until today. So the last time, and it's kind of interesting, the last election we saw this year in 2020, Trump got the most uh, African-American votes since 1960 when Nixon ran in 1960 against John Kennedy and lost. So really in the 1960 election, 1964, uh, especially 1964, when we saw uh, that African-Americans saw all this legislation passed in Jim Crow to create the Civil Rights uh, Act and the Voting Rights Act, they really swung their loyalties and allegiance to the Democratic Party. Uh, and still that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed since 1934. Uh, so in, uh, also uh, getting this allegiance is that Roosevelt uh, had a black cabinet, what he called the black cabinet, where he had the first sort of federal White House advisors that were advising him on issues of race in the United States and civil rights. Uh, but FDR didn't want to lose the support of whites now, especially in the South. So he's a Democrat uh, in the South. That is the one party that everyone's voting for in the South because it is the party of segregation. So he didn't mess with any of the Jim Crow laws that existed in the South, especially the poll tax. So you'd have to pay a tax if you were black in the South to be able to vote. You'd have to pay a special money. Whites didn't have to do that. He didn't touch that. And that was something that this black cabinet uh, that was advising him, wanted him to do, but he didn't touch it because he knew that it would anger uh, the white Democrats in the South. So he didn't touch that issue at all. And then lastly, I also want to talk about Native Americans. Tremendous uh, 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 effect happened to this group in uh, the Great Depression as well. So if we look at the average income prior to the Great Depression was $48. Uh, 
per month, which is really low. It's lowest among all the ethnic groups. And so hearing the calls of Native American tribes and reservations, hey, the federal government, you're supposed to be helping us, but you're not doing that. And so Franklin Roosevelt really stepped out and kind of forced Congress to pass what was called the Indian Reorganization Act, which gave Native American reservations more authority and less authority on the federal government. So less aid, less money being spent by the federal government, but it allows Native American tribes to kind of have more autonomy and do what they want. So this is why Native American tribes from the 1930s are allowed to do things that are kind of illegal activities anywhere else in the US, but on reservations, they're legal. Like when we talk about sort of having lesser taxes on alcohol or tobacco or gas, like an Indian reservation is a great place to buy that because there's less tax taxation uh, for Native American tribes or allowing casinos, for instance, or sports betting or other types of betting. You can do that really at any time. That's why we see on reservations these huge casinos, whereas otherwise off the reservation, you don't see them. It's because they have different rules going from uh, these treaties going back from the 1800s, but especially in the 1930s and the Great Depression. Uh, so and casinos have been a big financial boom uh, for Native American tribes. Many of these uh, casinos start in the 70s, 80s, but now we see gig gigantic ones. Tulalip, uh, you know, is the one closest to us, big Snow Snohomish. Uh, Snoqualmie Casino. So he, like any of these tribes have casinos and they're making lots of money, which is therefore supporting the reservation, supporting their education, supporting uh, in the income of many natives uh, that live on these reservations. So uh, it's given, it, this gave Native Americans more autonomy uh, and it's really improved uh, opportunities for natives uh, more so than what was previous available to them. Okay, so this ends our lecture on the Great Depression. Hopefully we didn't get thoroughly depressed and you guys aren't so sad, but uh, we are really gonna go from the Great Depression right into World War II. And so what ends the Great Depression it isn't so much government spending, what Roosevelt's doing, although it helped and it gave hope to many Americans, but it's really gonna be us swinging into World War II and needing to survive. Our survival's on the line and so uh, everyone we're gonna go from 25% unemployment and 10 years later, everyone gets to be employed. We're gonna to go to 1.2% unemployment, which is ridiculously low. Right now it's 4%, which is ridiculously low. Now it's going up because more restaurants are going out of business and stuff, but it's gonna be uh, gangbusters if you're looking for work in World War II because we're fighting for our survival. And so that's where we're gonna go after we start the semester break and start second semester, we're gonna start in World War II. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. All the lectures use this to get prepared for our Great Depression assessment, and we'll get thoroughly depressed one more time together. All right. Thanks, you guys.